Oh, and that is right. Did you hear and see that? Spring is most certainly sprung, at least out here in California. I am Rob Appel from Michael Miller Fabrics. When I'm inside, I'm on YouTube over at Making It Fun. And today's tutorial is all about how I draft quilt patterns for applique. Many of you know I love to get my inspiration from nature, the ocean, flowers, being outside, of course. And one of the things that I have found, especially now that I'm my own cameraman and editor, is the way I take photographs for pictures is not always the way I take photographs for quilt patterns. So let's start out here real quick. Let's get ourselves a fantastic photograph of a nice flower and then go turn that into an applique pattern. And that's right, the sun is completely up. It's like two in the afternoon, the worst time to take a photograph and people are out and about, so it's gonna probably be a little bit noisy and whatnot. But I do have this wonderful rose bush and I've been taking pictures of it for years and I grabbed a couple of photos earlier. But one of the things I wanna point out is when I'm dealing with pictures of like this rose here, what I'm really after for the quilt is all about the contrast. I wanna be able to see as much definition within the leaves there as possible. So I might change the angle of the camera around doing different things so that I see the leaves. I'm not worried about all of this background stuff because what happens in the background is completely erased. I'm just using individual flowers or individual elements from my photos to create patterns for fabric that I can raw edge applique. So when I take that picture, I'm only thinking of the rows and therefore I want as much detail and definition between the actual petals so that I can use those to draw or trace from. Let me show you how it's done. Now that we're back inside, let me just remind you, you can do whatever kind of editing you want to to your photograph. In this particular photo, I did push up the saturation a little bit to bring up a little bit more of the richness in color, but we're gonna do all of this manually. So I am doing this the old fashioned way before we had wonderful things like iPads and different tablets we could draw right on the surface of. So I wanna teach you today the method of, and I want you to all be thinking of where you can implement your own personal levels of technology. So we're doing this the old fashioned fashion way, but remember, technology is awesome. It's out there, but I know that not all of you all have the same toys, and so let's just do it this way. So yes, right now I have a wonderful light table underneath. This is from Daylight. Thank you, Daylight. I love this thing. I'm going to put a few pieces of paper underneath my image just to make sure I don't have any bleed through and I don't want it just to damage my table because I'm going to be drawing with a Sharpie marker. Right now the light table is turned off. All I need to do is go ahead and detail out the outline edges as I see them for creating the shape. So the first step is every single piece must be an actual bubble or a completed uh, connected circle, something like that, even though I know that's not a circle shape. I'm not thinking right now about labeling in the color pieces, but we will go back in here and do that in a moment you can see that I'm drawing based on the colors as I see. So this top piece was a much lighter than this dark piece. And in this flower, I see about three different shades I want to use. And I've chosen fabrics appropriately. And with applique like this, the closer the shades are, the more it's going to blend real nicely. If you want to do a lot of blending, of course, use more and more colors. So right now, as I start to go through and detail out like this, I can either think in colors one, two, three in my brain brain one is the lightest, or I can use L, M, and D for light, medium, and dark because I have three pieces. So in this one right now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to put an L right here, an L right here, an L right here. This is going to be a D for dark, a D for dark, and in this area right here, I'm actually going to take the time and come in here and put a little bit of a medium. So I go through here and I map out the entire image as I see it to create the outline shapes. One of the things I'd like to point out, if you think about this as an entire unit, a lot of times you can do a silhouette size piece or a single piece down and then build up your other two shades on top. And if you're doing something like that, you might want to look at this light color as the entire outline and then in that situation, you're just going to eventually cut out the pieces of different fabrics for your mediums and your darks, and you'll lay that up on top of your light shape.
any of the big pedal pieces like this where I see two definite shades in here where I've got the light and the medium, I'm gonna draw in a new line here. And I'm gonna add a little bit more wave and character to that. That way that those colors kind of bleed or blend through each other like that. So down in here, that would be a medium. Maybe even in this section, I'm gonna actually change my mind. That's gonna be dark. This will be medium. And then this over here will be the light. That makes this in here a medium. And I continue just to go through and choose each piece that I see and label it accordingly for this first step. I guess step one is take the photo. Step two is manipulate and begin your tracing. Step three, we're gonna actually prepare the pattern. Now that all of the pieces are all detailed in here, and you can see I've even kind of made my mind, my, my, changed my mind a couple of times in here. Now what we're gonna do is we are gonna take the moment, we're gonna flip this over, and that's what I was, I was using the Sharpie marker, was to kind of build up some of these lines. Now if you've never used fusible web, which is what we're gonna use to make our glue surface, it actually transposes or flips the image over. So by now, by me flipping this over like this, now I've actually effectively switched the flower from left to right something like that. Now I'm gonna take a clean piece of paper. This will be my pattern paper. And so what I actually wanna do on it is I wanna come back in here and I wanna write something like pattern or trace or something that is legible so I now know which side I am working on. Now as I go through here, what we really wanna do is I don't need to start in the center, is I'm gonna break down each piece as I go. And I have determined that the light fabric is the biggest quantity, so I'm gonna make one giant outline shape of my light fabric. So I'm gonna turn on my light table, I'm gonna actually increase the luminosity to full power, whoa, put on some sunglasses, right? And now what I can do is even though I'm gonna have some dark and medium shapes that lay in here on top, I'm going to trace one giant shape to become the background or outline silhouette. That entire piece there will now be labeled light. And I'm gonna label it number one. I might need a couple of highlight pieces to come back in on top of. For example, this little piece right here I may need it as a highlight, and there was another little piece right here that I really like that might be a highlight piece. There's actually two pieces next to each other, but because of the way they were shaped, it's actually easier to draw them as one piece, and now I can label that like light, excuse me, two, and this one could be L3. Now what I also want to do, because remember I'm mapping this out as I go along, I need to come back in here and the places where I put that, I am going to do down to L2, L2, there, and then this other long light piece now was the L3. That will make it so I can figure out what those pieces were when I go back, because remember they're going to be flipped over backwards once we get them put onto our fabric. So you go through and now you take your next shade. So let's go in and find our medium pieces, right? And so I'll go through here now and I'll think, okay, well here was one of those medium pieces. Now, because I have created a single underlay of that light color fabric, I don't have to worry about the lines being perfect because the light fabric will show through everywhere the darks and the mediums don't. And in the photograph, there are these beautiful little highlights between the petals on the flowers, and that's kind of what I'm going for as well. So any error or gap will actually look like a light outline, which really should give us some nice illumination. But nonetheless, that's my first medium piece, so I'm gonna now do that medium one, and now I need to come back to the map. I'm gonna come in here and go medium one. You can see I'm riding on this other side. So things get a little confusing and a little bit messy. A lot of times I'll actually switch to a different color pen, like a red pen or a pencil, so I can tell which side is which as well. Working around the flower, go ahead and find all of the shapes you need. build it all the way through, map all of these out, and as you're mapping out your sections, 
keep your like pieces, your lights next to each other, your mediums next to each other, and your darks next to each other. That way it's much more efficient when you get ready to cut and trace on your actual fabrics. Okay, so here we are and ready for, I think we're on phase three, but I basically have taken as a reminder, my wonderful photograph of the rose from the front yard. I detailed it from the front so I could find the outlines. I went ahead and traced it from the back again so I could go ahead and map out the different shades on the light table. That made life a little bit easier. Now I've gone ahead and laid everything out. And remember, I chose one of my colors to be my silhouette. It makes everything so much easier to manipulate, especially if we're gonna be placing this around other spots in our quilt, because I can technically kind of adhere things to that background and then move it in place so much easier. So that's gonna be really cool. As I was mentioning earlier, I've mapped out my lights in one area, my mediums in another, and my darks in another. I love the Heat and Bond Feather Light. It's a fusible applique paper, fusible web, we call it. And what it really is, and now fusible, excuse me, Heat and Bond is what I'm trying to say, comes in three flavors. The red package is called No Sew. Don't try to stitch through it. You'll ruin your machine, literally. This stuff here is the bluish purple, and it's the light version, and it's fantastic. Um, the regular version, I think, was kind of a pink packaging. Now, when you look at this stuff, it's a perfect glue sheet on the paper. There's kind of a tacky, sticky, shiny side. The other side is the paper. So what I want you to do, and you won't need your light table for this, but you certainly could use it, is I want you to go ahead and map out, again, each piece in its own individual um, section. So let's just focus on our light fabric real quick. And I'm gonna come in here and I'm gonna trace this. And because this is the paperback, the glue fusible web, it's this product right here that causes the transposition or the flipping of our design when we're doing this. So if you're ever doing a portrait of a person, you always wanna flip the people around because believe it or not, we're not as symmetrical as you may think. And you don't want a backwards person. You'll look like your brother or your sister. You won't look like yourself. And um, if you're doing lettering, of course, with the exception of the letter O, sometimes a capital N, you don't want those backwards either. This is light number one. And as I was pointing out, I wanna make all of this work really nice together. So now I can even manipulate again. Fusible web is not at all dependent on the grain of the fabric. So it doesn't matter the orientation of any of this stuff. Put a number, keep track of where you're at. So you can see I'm even tucking in the other pieces even closer with a little bit more detail, and that's just to really save up the fusible web and our fabric. So you do that with all of your colors, right? And then what I'd like you to do is I'd like you to go ahead and you can use a little rotary cutter like my little shark that I invented a while back, and you can just go ahead and lightly cut out, but I want you to make sure that you leave extra paper around the outline. We don't cut on the outline until it's on the back of the fabric. This is my light fabric, so I'm gonna go one, two, three, and this is what I'm calling my lightest of the shades. I'll put it on the back side of this solid fabric. <laughs> I make a joke out of that in every single video that I use solids, I love that. But I am pointing it out, if you're using the fusible web, it goes on the back side of the print fabric too. So if you're using something that has some cool printed mottling in it, um, or a batik or something like that, of course, you want to do that. The shiny side is the glue. The rough side is the glue. So you want to put that down and you're going to go ahead now with the heat and bond feather light. It's a hot, dry iron. Let's just take a moment and slow down here. You've noticed that my wonderful Panasonic cordless iron has gone missing and Sherman is back in action. And well, the other iron sure lasted an awfully long time. So I won't say anything negative about that Panasonic, but Sherman's back. Welcome Sherman. He's a mess. We'll clean him up real soon. Okay, so now, and that was a request I got in one of the other videos, like, hey, dude, that video, that iron is just too much for me. So yes, we're getting there, but not today. So I'm just gonna take a real quick second here and I'm gonna iron the fusible web. The heat and bond feather light just takes literally about two or three seconds to bond the first time. Always better to underbond the first time because we can overbond the second time. You just wanna make sure the paper peels off nicely. Again, as I come back in here to my prep area, the other thing I've always learned to do is I have two piles of my stash, one without fusible web and one with fusible web. So once something's fused, I cut around it to make sure that I never have fused parts going back into my regular stash because I don't want to accidentally miss one of those later on and end up with it getting ironed to something it doesn't belong to. 
So of course, take the time to do this for all of your colors first, but once they are all on there, go ahead and just grab some easy little scissors like yay, and just get in here and start to separate out the individual pieces. And I never try to waste a moment, so I'm separating those off of there while cutting along the line. Okay, now if you've seen my shark apple cutter in the past, it's awesome, but these are tiny, tiny little pieces. For something like this, I'm gonna use my nice scissors, and what I do is I start at the back of the blade, and I kind of just wiggle the shape through the scissor as the blade itself is closing down. And I know this is supposed to be about building the pattern, not building the actual finished example, but hey, you're gonna to wanna to know this trick, so you're welcome. So you cut out all your little pieces just like that. If you're gonna use the shark rotary cutter because you already have one or you wanna get one, they're awesome, please hold it like a pen. It's got a little dorsal fin on it so you can put pressure on there. And then again, that's gonna be used and you're just gonna get in here on the line and you can cut out a lot of your larger shapes with a tool like this, the little miniature 14 millimeter rotary cutters. But for the most part, something like this is so tiny, you'll probably find it really is just as efficient to go ahead and use your standard scissors. So cut out all your shapes. And when you've got all that done, I'll meet you right back here and show you real quickly how we can get this assembled. So the pieces are definitely really, really small, but it's okay, it doesn't make it any more challenging. It actually should be pretty dang easy to get this little thing back together. So all of the pieces have been cut out. They all have their fusible web on the back. Now what I need to do, it's a little more challenging because the pattern is technically reversed. So you can work from either side, however it's gonna help you to get your orientation back together. So for me, now the rose you can see is gonna fit back in this way. And in the past, I've even used like a tracing sheet underneath it when I'm using my portraits to make sure I get all of the features lined up right where they belong. In this situation, it won't matter that much. And I'm glad I stopped myself. I don't know if you watch my busy little hand starting to work here, but I would like us to leave the paper on the bottom layer. That's going to prevent it from sticking to anything else as well as it'll give us the opportunity to transport it and move it around a little bit just like we were talking about a moment ago. So we're going to leave our paper on our light piece. The next thing we want to evaluate is any of the second layer. So in this situation I've used the dark and the mediums together in the center but I just made my dark one big shape. So a lot of times what I'll do, I'll come back in here, I found that this is the dark piece that now represents all of these pieces within here, right? And in order to do this, there's the paper on the back, I'm going to go ahead and get underneath this edge with my little stiletto um, or a pin or something like that. And now what I can kind of do is I can kind of come in here and I can find where I had manipulated the layout by rotating and rotating until I see right where it's gonna go. You see how I had that little finger that fit up in there, right where it's gonna go there. So now I kind of have an idea that it's gonna hug right in on this line here. Now the next key is please do not iron this one little shape in place. You need to get everything in place and then you might even want to tack it with like one of those clover mini irons instead of hitting it with something big and industrial like dirty old Sherman over here. So at any rate we have this now medium piece kind of laid out in the center of the rows and of course now I can see that excuse me that was the dark and now I have my piece I had labeled like for my medium uh, that goes on top of that and now I kind of find this itsy bitsy little piece here and that'll lay in like yay and you're just going to start to go through and build in all of your detail pieces as you go so that you can find each and every little shape and start to bring your colors and your design right back together. Then just as you're adding in your new positions, find key anchor points as you find in your photograph and allow them to work together in your favor that way. Sometimes with the small pieces, it's really a lot easier just to go ahead and use a pair of tweezers to manipulate, but you can see now where the medium and the dark are joining on top of the light and how that's coming together so nicely there. You'll also find as you add in new pieces, it gets easier and easier to relocate some of those early pieces you put in because you'll notice that your registration wasn't what you thought it should be. 
you can then go ahead and take any of those little light highlight details like we needed to really accent that center and then you can lay them in on the very, very tippy top. So you've got all of your little pieces in place, double checking to make sure I don't have anything left over in my scrap pile there. Now real quick, what we want to do, and again, you could use your Clover mini iron to just put a small little tacking on this, but I want to just go ahead real quick and bond by pushing down one, two, lift. And that has gone ahead and heated everything up. I'm not going to touch anything. I'm not going to move anything until it's totally cool because you, then I can, like I said, manipulate it. And you're saying, well, what do you do with something like that? It's awfully tiny. And of course, this could be one bouquet in a beautiful quilt that you're building. Or if you've seen one of the recent quilt uh, tutorials I put out, uh, my good buddy Mike and I, who's sleeping over here on the job, apparently, we're doing these fun little postcards. And these can be mailed out in the mail. So this was kind of fun. I was digging through my stash and please don't get mad at your local quilt shops for not having this on the shelf. This was one of my very first pieces of fabric I started quilting with which would have been almost 20 years ago but it's a fun landscape from Michael Miller Fabrics way back when called Park Landscape. So what I've done is I've taken a little rectangle roughly a little bit larger oh, a little bit larger than our postcards we're making right. So with this now I can go ahead and get the orientation. I've already pressed the postcard to make sure that it's um wrinkle free. Now I can come into my little rows, right? So everything's, ooh, that looks really great. And everything is adhered nicely. Now I can peel off this back. And then I could center this or position it as I like into my landscape like this. Now I'm gonna come back in here that the paper's off that back and I'm gonna give it one, two, three, that's about it, a little bit of a smoothie rub like that. Now if you press it too long, some of the pieces may start to lift up. And if that ever happens, of course, we're just gonna stitch them down or hit them with a little glue stick as we are done. But look at that. So it does look awfully great, doesn't it? And super, super simple. I hope you picked up on those steps of how you can produce any design into your own fusible applique pattern. And that heat and bond feather light makes life so easy so that anything that you can draw, even from a photograph, can now become your very own applique pattern. Put out a reminder, coloring books work fantastically for those basic outlines, so does the internet. But if you're gonna do it, especially if you're gonna compete with that quilt, make sure you have permissions to use that image. That's why I like to go out and start by snapping the photograph first myself and then detailing it all the way through and don't forget you can blend photos before you blend them into your applique pattern and put them into a fantastic quilt. So again, people have been asking me for a long time, how do I do this? I hope this helps simplify a little bit. Remember, if you have an iPad or some sort of similar tablet style technology, all of these steps can be done right there on the surface before you go to print it out, making life so much more easy. And if it's easy, hey, I think it's fun, right? Thanks again for joining me for a real quick little tutorial here at Making It Fun. I will see you very soon in another awesome tutorial. I'm glad to see you're still there. Hey, if you insist on spending all day on YouTube, great with me. Please check out a few of my other videos. I think they're fantastic. Hit that subscribe button. Hit the bell to be notified. We'll see you next time for another Helping of Fun.